is take perhaps three questions at a time from the audience and then have you answer them rather than one after another. So who would, I can't really see out there, but. Mary is here. And Mahbubani, Professor Mahbubani. We'll come to Mary second, but there's, there's a gentleman there. Yes, thank you, sir. I'm the Palestinian ambassador to the UK. Wow. And well, I was a great fan. What's your name, sir? My name is Professor Manuel Hassassian. Shukran. Thank In 1998, I was a, one of the greatest fans of Mr. Barak to the point when I used to write articles, I said, here comes a leader who is a disciple of a great leader like Rabin and a man that I consider to be a white hope. This doesn't still undermine my impressions of Mr. Barak as being still the voice of reason in such a narrow right-wing government in Israel. I still believe that he could be the, the dramatic force in changing the perceptions of such a, uh, such a regime in Israel. And we are not here to be involved in a polemical discourse and finger pointing who is right, who is wrong, whether settlement activities is right or wrong, whether Abu Mazen is weak or ineffective. I think we have to transcend this polemical discourse into something much more positive. The reason why I'm saying this is that we have today being stuck in the historically inevitable and the politically impossible. I think we have to move a little bit forward. And moving forward from the tact tactics of myopic crisis management into something that we consider to be a long range objective of conflict resolution. And my question to Mr. Barak, it, he has been empowered now two years. When is the right time? When are the conditions conducive? When can we look at this glass as being half full rather than being stuck in the adversarial position of trying to say that you are wrong, I'm right, and move forward when we know that the crux of the problem in the Middle East today is the non-solution of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. The Arab Spring, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan are all peripheral issues that emanated because of the non-solution of this important conflict. Okay. When we talk about peace, security, and what have you, that could reign supreme in the Middle East, I think if we resolve our problems and be strong enough to have the determination as leaders to come forward without putting any conditions and say, let's put all the package on the table and let's clinch a deal with the white smoke. And that's why we need Europeans to help the Americans in facilitating this process. Why don't and you I wish Mr. Barak yeah. could be that important leader, which I always revered, as he could be the draconian change in such a government in Israel to have the boldness to come forward and to tell Abu Mazen, come here, let us sit, and let's make a deal. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you respond to that now, if, if you like? OK. Um, first of all, I would la like to make my modest observation. I think that what happens with Iran and the Arab Spring are not kind of the result of the inability to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There is no causal chain that leads uh, from the conflict to, to these events. They are beyond us. But it's true that the fact that we had not yet been able to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, is used as a sometimes excuse, as sometimes explanation by those who are uh, uh, who wants to, to kind of manipulate a little bit our perception of, of the severity uh, both of uh, threats and in the Arab Spring over even of opportunities that uh, are embedded into this development. So I don't believe that we are the reason for it, but I agree that that's part of the discourse and the public uh, discourse about these issues. I think that the time is now, uh, mainly because uh, that's what the Quartet uh, proposed. The Quartet are not just uh, four individuals kind of elected themselves to uh, guide us. It's basically it's uh, America, uh, Russia, uh, European Union, and the UN. So the, all the powers uh, relevant in the world expect us and the Palestinians to sit together and, and start uh, working with no preconditions uh, makes it the right time. But having said no 
preconditions. We really have to avoid any preconditions from being put on the table because whenever uh, we feel that the Palestinians are putting certain preconditions, like uh, putting an end to any, uh, any uh, construction activity, that ends up to be part of the blame game rather than part of, of a serious attempt to, to enter. And I, I believe that we have to find a way to start it. Uh, normally, at, uh, immediately after election in Israel, there is always the opportunity or the chance that a unity government will be created for which any entering into negotiate doesn't create any dissonance and it will simplify things from other, our side but put uh, the Palestinians into tougher test. Another op uh, opportunity that was raised more than once is, is looking at the precedents, how the uh, agreement with Egypt started. That was, there was the Tuhami uh, dealing with Dayan that created the, the background, the, the launching pad. Uh, even in Oslo, we, we had certain discussions with Palestinians long before it emerged or, or uh, pushed to the surface in, in some Scandinavian woods, and uh, it created the, the launching pad. Uh, probably something like this could help, and probably the active support of the world. But we expect, of course, that this support will be even-handed, that we, the world will look at the same open-minded way into our consideration, demands, and security needs uh, as, as well as into the Palestinian ones. And to summarize, I believe that the time is ripe, that we should go. Uh, I can tell you that from our government, there is readiness to enter into the negotiating room without any preconditions. And Netanyahu himself said more than once, he is ready to start it immediately. Mary Robinson, please. Ladies first, uh, Professor. Thank you. Um, I heard if I could begin by saying that I agree with the, uh, His Excellency, the ambassador, the Palestinian ambassador from the United Kingdom, that you are somebody who seeks to uh, find a solution. And as you know, I am one of the elders, and the elders have been very the concerned. youngest among the elders. I, yeah. I was, I'm very glad you said that, yes. Um, my husband, unfortunately, goes around describing himself as a nursemaid to one of the elders, which is not so, <laughs> not so good. Um, and we, we have been um, supportive of the initiative which was taken by the Palestinians to seek recognition from the um, United Nations. They've gone the route of the Security Council, but we know that if they go the route of the General Assembly, there will be a very significant majority there. And um, I've been puzzled at the rooted opposition to this because it's an ingredient. It's an ingredient that would enhance the sense of status of, on the Palestinian side. It doesn't change anything on the ground. In, in fact, it's, it's symbolic. Um, and I wondered if you could comment on just why there is such rooted opposition, um, in fact, both from Israel and from the United States, when UNESCO recognized uh, Palestine um, as a member, um, all the funding was cut off. I mean, it's, it, 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 but it, it, it does seem hard to understand why um, the issue is so hardline. Got it. Let's take one more question. Chris, Chris Dickey, please. Yeah, uh, Christopher Dickey with Newsweek. Uh, a short question, maybe not a simple one. I think there's a lot of concern in the United States even among people who would like to see some kind of action taken to get rid of the nuclear potential in Iran, that Israel might be able to start a war, but the United States would have to finish the war. How, what kind of scenario can you point, paint, theoretically of course, in which Israel could eliminate Iran's nuclear potential and it wouldn't lead to a conflict that would forcibly would, in fact, involve the United States of America. OK, why don't you deal with those two, yeah? But I, I've noticed that Professor uh, Mohababani raised his hand twice. And no, no, no. I mean, once again, it could be all right, fine. perceived I mean, as a discrimination against Asians. Uh, please. Thank, thank, thank you. I, 